We're going to deep dive right now into the back half of Acts chapter 5 in this extension and a great place to gain a lot of context as well as a lot of content. They're different. I think they're both necessary. You have to have the proper content, but content without context does not help you uh, at all. So if you want to have a little bit more about the back half here where we're going to go in Acts chapter 5, go watch the message, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us. Everything that I'll reference, the links are all in the description, so hopefully those will help you if you haven't watched them. But that would help you a lot before you even get into this. Maybe click pause and then go do that. Short version, though, if you're not going to do that and you just want to dive in, short version would be this. God was showing off, and he was showing off his power specifically through the apostles. The love that they had for the people, the power then to see them healed, you can see that miraculous signs and wonders is just popping off in Jerusalem. And this is getting the attention, though, now of the Sanhedrin. They are ticked. These hypocritical religious leaders are ticked because they're helping people. I'll never understand why people get frustrated and upset when we're helping people, but they even do it today with the church. And so the Sanhedrin, as they're referred to, they throw the apostles in jail. An angel breaks them out of jail, just like happens with Peter in Acts chapter 12. And then... The apostles, rather than running, rather than hiding after they're thrown in jail, they break out and they go right back doing exactly what they were doing before and they start preaching the gospel again. That they were told, don't do it. They're like, if the angel's going to break us out, we're just going to keep preaching. So this makes the Sanhedrin extremely angry because they said, don't be doing that. So the Sanhedrin then calls the apostles back in to stand before them. The high priest began to question them. And here we are, Acts 5, verse 28. That's like, Short ketchup, we're now caught up. That's called, what's it called? Like the short version, Spark Notes? There it is, Spark Notes version. Let's get to verse 28 now. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. <laughs> that phrase just still kits me, man. Make us guilty of this man's blood. Blood. You can't make someone guilty. You can be guilty, but you can't make someone be guilty. And so they're saying, you're trying to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter's like, no, 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 no. I got proof that you are guilty. I know for sure that you are guilty. You just need to accept for yourself that you're guilty. So this is what he says in verse 30 to back up the response here. Verse 28, the high priest comes at him. Verse 30, Peter's like, listen, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed. He's like, listen, I don't need to like assume or make like an assumption about the fact whether or not you did it. You did it. You killed him by hanging him on a cross. You are guilty. You know, you know how I know you're guilty? Because you were there at the cross with the Romans when Jesus bled and died. You killed him. I don't need to make you guilty. You are guilty. Peter's saying. I want to back up just for a second, though, because this section of Scripture is actually really amazing. It's like a little, you call, a, you call it a sermonette. It's a little mini sermon that Peter gives here, specifically to the Sanhedrin, verses 29 to 33. Let me read it, and I just want to break down this section of the text, because I really think there's a lot of meat here that we need to understand historically, and then even just from the law that they understood. Why did this trigger them so much? Let's read it. Verse 29. Peter and the, other, and the other apostles replied. Remember, this was after he's like, hey, you can't be preaching. He's like, Pff. we must obey God rather than human beings. Now that I read verse 30, remember? The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his right hand, his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. These few verses straight triggered the Sanhedrin. And I think many times we're like, bro, why, why are you getting so furious? You want to put them to death because of these things? You have to understand the context based upon their culture, why this was such a big deal. I talk a lot more about... If you're maybe even confused, Sanhedrin, yeah, I'm not taking time to break it down. 
because I've already done that. I did an extension called Can't Keep Quiet. If you go watch that, listen to it, you're going to learn a lot more about who the Sanhedrin is. But I want to break down why did this trigger them so much? What points is Peter driving home as he's speaking that causes them to be so triggered? I'm going to jump to verse 30 because I already broke down all of verse 29 in the sermon Nothing's going to stop us. I talked a lot about verse 29, that we must obey God rather than human beings. But let's jump to verse 30. Let's read it again, and then we'll dive in. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Why is that so important? It's important because when Peter says this phrase, hanging him on a cross, this was a specific rest, uh, reference to the Old Testament law that they knew very well from the book of Deuteronomy. Remember, you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Old Testament. It's referred to as the Pentateuch. This is their Torah, their law. This is like, this was by the book they were going to follow the rules and regulations in this. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, it specifically states that when someone is hung on a pole or a tree, depending on what um, translations uh, of the Bible that you're reading. They're under God's curse. So the reason that it triggers them is because the Apostle Paul is breaking down the full context of the importance of Jesus dying on the cross. But he's saying, listen, you are the ones that made him die on a cross because they understood it that if somebody dies on the cross, they're cursed. And so they saw it as if they're guilty of the blood, then they're guilty of the curse. But see, we have a much bigger picture from what they had just from Deuteronomy 21. The Apostle Paul later teaches us in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, when he writes that letter, that he wants to clarify their religious thinking and really explain the purpose of the cross. Chapter 3, look at verse 13. He said, Christ, he's saying, Jesus redeemed us from the curse. So they think, you, you're telling us we're guilty of the blood, so we're cursed? No, 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 no. He's saying Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. And then he references in Deuteronomy. For it is written, cursed is anyone who is hung on a pole. So Paul takes Deuteronomy 21, and he breaks it down for us to understand that, no, we're not cursed. The curse has been taken from us, and it was placed on Jesus so that when he died and became a curse, we didn't have to become a curse. But let me break it down even further. What is the purpose of the cross? That this man, you hung him on a cross, Paul says. What's the purpose of the cross? Because you need to understand this. The cross didn't save anybody. Jesus saved everybody. It wasn't the cross. The cross didn't do anything. The cross was a hunk of wood. The, the cross was just wood, a tree fashioned in a specific symbol now for us or in a specific pattern so they could stretch out their arms and nail them and their feet to nail them. They had a little rest for their head. I don't know, like the Romans just came up with a torture mechanism. But it was, see, the Jews that said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Pontius Pilate didn't want to. The Jews would have never gotten their hands on the perfect Jesus if these religious leaders hadn't pushed it. That's why I said, you're the ones that killed him. But see, the cross is important not because it's what saved us. Jesus saved us. The cross is important because it became the place to take God's judgment and to take the curse so that we could be forgiven and blessed. Jesus, yes, became the curse, but he left it with blood on the cross. He himself then went in the tomb and resurrected. We'll get, we'll get there in, in, in a second here because it references that too. But he was resurrected, as it said in verse 30, right? God, our ancestors, raised Jesus from the dead. I'll, let me just approach that now. Raised him from the dead. So now there's a couple things happening. The cross that took the blood took the curse. The tomb then is where all of our sin and shame and everything was left in. So when Jesus resurrects, is raised from the dead. Now that same power of the Holy Spirit that resurrected him, that Holy Spirit can now reside inside of us. That resurrection power can reside inside of us. So rather than us being cursed, Jesus proved through the cross and the tomb that now we get to be blessed. That's what Paul's trying to break down in Galatians chapter 3. So everything I just broke down from verse 30 was why they're getting triggered. Because they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa we're cursed? No, no, no. Paul tells us through Jesus you can be blessed. 
Peter continues in verse 31. He said, God exalted him. Man, he didn't just resurrect. He ascended to heaven, and God exalted to him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. See, they knew the Old Testament references. They knew the reference of prince and savior in the Old Testament very well. Let me just give you two. There's a bunch of them, but just two from Isaiah. Isaiah 9, verse 6, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and what? Prince of Peace, Isaiah 45, verse 21. There is no God apart from me, a righteous God, and what? A Savior. There is none but me. There's so many different references that I could give you, but just to give you quick perspective, that's why they're triggered. Why? Because Peter is continually establishing that Jesus is who? God. Because they knew that God is the one referenced in Isaiah 9. God is the one referenced in Isaiah 45. He is God. And so Peter keeps saying, yes, Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God because that is who he is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus is God. But see, Peter also gives reference here, I just said it here, that Jesus is referenced to the right hand of God. And they knew very well, this also in Scripture, the right hand of God was a hand of power. The, I believe in the book of Psalms, it even talks about the right hand of God casting a shadow over his people. There was something about the power of the right hand that they were very well aware of. So I wonder then if this is why, as Peter made this statement in Acts 5, I wonder if this is why they got so ticked off in Acts 7. Remember when they're about to stone Stephen and he makes this, this statement and they go ballistic, verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And what? Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So they freak out. <laughs> Look, he said, I see heaven open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their lungs, they rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. They freaked out out. I wonder if they freaked out because they remember when Peter had first referenced Jesus at the right hand of God in here in, in Acts 5. And it's all coming together because these are the same men that stood before these same people. The apostle Peter in Acts 5, the deacon Stephen in Acts chapter 7. I talk more about that in the extension camp. Keep quiet. Look at verse 32 now. Peter continues, and he says, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who, what does he say? Obey him. I love how Peter brings things back around here. Because remember, he starts with verse 29, with this thought of obedience. Verse 29, he says, we must obey God rather than human beings. And now he brings it back around again. And what is he showing here? He's showing that their receiving of the Holy Spirit is evidence that they were living in obedience. The receiving of the Holy Spirit was the evidence that they were people that were living in obedience of God. So when Peter says, we must obey God rather than man, he then brings it back around later. We're witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit witnesses. The Holy Spirit testifies. And what does he testify? He testifies that I can only be given to those who obey Jesus. Oh, so Peter's just building upon this, building upon this. But you notice how he starts here? He, you notice this phrase? He says, we are witnesses. This became a really important identity piece for Peter to be a witness. I don't know if it's because he did it wrong at one point. Remember, he denied Jesus three times. The rooster crowed. And man, Peter wasn't at the cross. When they said, whoa, 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 whoa. Aren't you one of the followers of this Jesus? Aren't you? The, haven't you been with this Galilean? Didn't we see you? No. He cursed. I never knew him. Is now this such an important piece? Because he's like, man, I could have been a witness of Jesus and I turned on him. Why did I not? Why did I not stay true to that? Is that why? Or maybe it's because it's one of the last things that Jesus said before he left planet Earth. Remember in Acts 1:8? He said, but you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what did, what did Jesus say? And you will be my witnesses 
in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. I, I don't know. For whatever reason, it stuck with Peter. So then when he gets to Caesarea and he's at Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10, he's like, I got to talk about it. Remember, he has the vision on the roof. He goes with the men and he's like, okay, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to drive this home. So in Acts 5, he tells the Sanhedrin, we are witnesses of these things. In Acts 10, though, and when he's in Cornelius' house in verse 39, he didn't say we are witnesses of these things. He said, we are witnesses of everything. We are witnesses of everything he, Jesus, did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him. He, he's, he's bringing it around again, just like in Acts 5, by hanging him on a cross. So remember, just like in Acts 5, in Acts 10, he's connecting back to Deuteronomy 21. He's making it clear, hanging him on a cross. He was cursed. Why? So we didn't have to be cursed. He's making this clear, and every time he brings, it's like the cross, the cross. We're witnesses of the cross. We're witnesses of the resurrection. He's making it simple. Can I tell you today, it's simple. We might not have been there, but we still, through the power of the Holy Spirit and God's holy scriptures, we are witnesses of the cross, the death of Jesus, and the tomb, the resurrection of Jesus. He tells them, we're witnesses of everything. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. Man, when Peter's preaching to these boys in Acts 5, he did not care a single bit whether or not these guys liked what they were hearing. He was not there to please them. He was there to please God. So he's like, listen, I'm on mission to declare one thing, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, not to please you. Isn't that what he said in verse 29? Am I here to obey God or to obey you? So we know it gets revved up because we remember we already read it, verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. So they're getting ready to kill him. And the Bible says, finally, that a trusted and honored Pharisee who was a part of the Sanhedrin for a while, his name is Gamaliel. Gamaliel pipes up and he begins to share, listen, look at your boy, 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 boy. Hey, hey, settle down. Remember before we've seen this, guys have risen up, they've had followers, they're going to lead a revolt and then they died and it fizzled out. We've seen it with multiple people. He references them here in this passage in, in Acts 5. We're just giving the short version here. He's like, just chill out. So let me just tell you this. Take a breath. Verse 38. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Leave, leave them alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. You know what he's saying? He's saying if it's of human origin, it'll fail. But if it's of God origin, he's about to say, woo. But if it is from God, if it is of God origin, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Remember, part of the reason, I talked about this a little bit in the message, nothing's going to stop us, but let me just give you a little bit more. Part of the reason that Gamaliel was so respected was how he raised up, trained, taught his students, specifically a student that shined even brighter than the rest, who was an expert in the law. Who was it? Saul of Tarsus. Later we know who became the apostle Paul. Some of Gamaliel's clout came from Saul of Tarsus, Paul. We also know, though, that Paul uses Gamaliel to also have some of the same clout to be respected in some of the same way. Like if I can reference Gamaliel, hopefully they'll listen to me because they know Gamaliel. Gamaliel is like, they know Saul. Paul, like Paul is like, they know Gamaliel. This will help me. How, where's that at? Acts 22, verse three, he references him. Then Paul said, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied, I studied under Gamaliel. There it is. He's like, I got to reference. I got to reference my boy Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. And I was as zealous for God as any of you are today. So you see the reference. He's referencing their connection here. See, Scripture doesn't specifically say this. It doesn't tell us. But I'm going to show you how you begin to, in Scripture, break down what could have happened. 
we just read it a lot of times. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Move on to the next chapter. No, 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 no. There's a whole lot happening in Acts 5 that it doesn't say, but you have to look to the other chapters in Acts or the other books of the Bible or history to make it all come together. So what's happening here in Acts 5? What I want us to understand is it might not specifically tell us this, but I am telling you, we can at the very least speculate. I believe even greater than speculation. I really believe we could just really almost solidify it clearly that Saul of Tarsus, aka the Apostle Paul, he's there at Acts chapter 5. He's not mentioned one time, but he's there. Let me give you two findings of why I can tell you that he's there. Finding number one is that in Acts chapter 7, he's on the scene when Stephen is being stoned. Remember, we just read that they rushed, they dragged Stephen out of the city in Acts chapter 7, they stoned him. The Sanhedrin did that. The same people that Peter's standing before right now in Acts chapter 5, they're doing this in Acts chapter 7 now, the same guys. And it says in verse 58, meanwhile, while they're stoning him, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So we know for sure that Saul's there in Acts chapter 7. We know that the Sanhedrin is there, the same people that are there in Acts 5. They're there in Acts 7. And we know here if he's holding the coats, he's showing approval because in the next chapter, Acts chapter 8, and Paul gave approval, it says. So he's very connected and tied in. We know for sure. Let's just start there. We know that he's tight with the Sanhedrin. We know that for sure. So that's finding number one. Number two, though, it goes even deeper. Look at Acts 26, verse 10. And it says... And that is just what I did in Jerusalem, he's saying. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. Now, it's referencing in Acts 9 how he's going with letters uh, from the Sanhedrin, the high, high priest, and he's like trying to kill, imprison, to just, just destroy as many Christians as he possibly can. That's what he's referencing here. And, and when they were put to death, so now we know that he just didn't imprison them. We know for sure because Acts 9, it doesn't say put to death. It references imprisoning them. So if you stop there, that's not enough. You get to Acts 26, he tells us more story. This is when he's standing before King Agrippa II. He's giving more story, and he's going, listen, I put him to death, but here's what I want you to catch. This is the main piece. That's just all a little bit extra. He goes, I cast my vote against them. What does that mean? I cast my vote. To cast a vote would have meant that Saul of Tarsus was a member of the Sanhedrin council. So let's just keep putting all the information together. If he was able to cast a vote, if he was there in Acts 7 holding their coats when the Sanhedrin stoned him, and if casting a vote meant he was a part of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was there in Acts 7, and we know that the Sanhedrin is there in Acts 5, what does that mean? That means in Acts 5, when Gamaliel is giving this speech, when they're ticked at Peter, can you imagine this? Saul of Tarsus is there in Acts 5. When Peter, oh man, I'm about to cry. When Peter and all the apostles are standing there before all the Sanhedrin, Saul of Tarsus is there. This same Saul of Tarsus who later would become just like them an apostle, Paul. As he saw them tortured, he later would become tortured. As he saw them in prison, he would later become in prison. He was there in Acts 5. And see, because he was there, he heard Gamaliel's speech. And I, I imagine that that speech... What did Gamaliel say? Verse 39. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. I imagine that those words reverberated in Saul of Tarsus' ears. Acts 9. He's on the road to Damascus to find more Christians and imprison and kill them simply because they follow Jesus. Jesus shows up in a bright, blinding light, and he goes blind for three days. If he's an expert in the law, that means he has a pretty good memory. Can you imagine for three days, he's hearing Acts 5.39 over. He's hearing the voice of his mentor over and over and over again. 
you will not be able to stop these men. You'll only fighting, find yourself fighting against God to just think, man, why didn't I listen? Why didn't I hear that? Why didn't I follow that? Why did I become so bloodthirsty? Because see, Gamaliel, he had, a, he had a good pace to his leadership. He had some restraint. He was wise. Paul was a young man, it's described here. When we're young, in our passion, we get moving too quick and we can do things wrong. Guilty. But Gamaliel had the wisdom, the restraint. Saul didn't. Hungry, thirsty for blood. Hungry, thirsty to prove himself. When you're aiming so hard to prove yourself, you can do some really stupid stuff. Because proving many times does not have pace. And there's something about when you have patience and you have a pace, you're not living to prove, you're just living to be approved. That's what scripture says, to be approved by God and man. And he's running, proving himself, no pace. And then he's just stopped by Jesus. And these words I imagine from Gamaliel are just on repeat. That's when Jesus tells Ananias, go get Paul. He's hearing me now. He's going to be my chosen instrument. That's why he's referencing now later in Acts 26 and Acts 22 and all these places that we're reading. He's referencing later like, okay, I didn't get it then, but man, trust me, I get it now. I look back and I wish I had listened. See, Gamaliel had the restraint. The rest of Sanhedrin, they didn't have the restraint. You read in verse 40, it says that Gamaliel's speech persuaded them. It must not have persuaded them that much, though. It says that they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Well, wherever you are, however you're doing this, if you're driving, don't do what I'm about to say, but close your eyes. I want you to just close your eyes and picture this for a second. The apostles are flogged, they're beaten, they're whipped, they're busted up. It says it's so nonchalant, right? It says, and they flogged them and then they let them go. But no picture for a second. Watch them in your mind, not just getting beat. Let's finish that. They're walking away. What do they look like walking away right now? I think so many times we picture, well, beating's done. Have a nice day. And we just see him just walking away. Do you realize that after they were flogged medically, what, what happened to their body in this moment? After they were flogged, their spine was never the same again. The spine would never heal correctly ever again. It wasn't like, well, go to a chiropractor, get it fixed. Their spine never healed the right way ever again. They could not stand straight anymore. They're hunched the rest of their days. They walked with a limp the rest of their days. They were never the same ever again. But see, they were okay with that because they knew because of Jesus, they would never be the same ever again. They knew that. And I imagine what's amazing about this is that even with a limp, they would still pick their head up high because they recognized that where they walked, they cast shadows, and where they cast shadows, people were healed and miracles happened, even with a limp. There's something about, for them, when the physical body took torture or was changed, it was continually a reminder that they had been changed by Jesus. That's what we see in verse 41. It says that the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of, of suffering disgrace for the name. We've been changed. We're suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus day after day in the temple courts and from house to house. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. What is that? Jesus Christ is Lord. Christ and Messiah. Same word here. They never stop sharing the good news. They never stop preaching about Jesus, never stop talking about him. Why? Because the more they suffered disgrace, put that in quotes, that's what it says, disgrace for the name, the more they were disgraced, the more they suffered, the more they recognized that they were being counted worthy to carry his name. How many people are carrying his name, but they're not acting like it? 
How many people are carrying his name, but they're not talking like it? How many people are wearing crosses around their neck, but they ain't picking up their cross and following him? They were suffering disgrace for the name. When I say suffering, I'm not talking about they're having a bad day. I'm not talking about just like, oh, it's just a, my emotion today. I'm having a bad day. When I say that they, they were suffering, that means they were tortured. They were imprisoned. And they were killed. I, I mean, I discussed this in, in the sermon, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us, the death of all of the apostles. I want to just focus in, lean in a little bit further, though, to the martyrdom of Peter and John, because Peter and John, they're mentioned many times as a duo doing ministry together. And if you go look in our Keep Us Dangerous volumes, all of volume three, if you look at the message, Cha Cha Jesus, which is on Acts 3, Spirit, uh, Son, uh, School of the Spirit, that's Acts 4, the extension, One People, uh, Planting the Persecuted, um, that whole volume, it's all referencing Peter and John. It keeps referencing Peter and John, Peter and John. It was like one of the older apostles and the youngest apostle doing ministry. The way Jesus kind of paired them up and the way they continued to go out as he, after he ascended. It's really amazing as they're doing ministry together. And there's a lot of references where Jesus, when he was here, was kind of talking about them. One of them, he actually prophesied how their deaths would take place. After Jesus had denied, uh, sorry, after Peter had denied Jesus three times, when Jesus was reinstating him in John 21, remember he goes, do you love me? He's like, Peter's like, yes, Lord, I love you. Then feed my lambs, feed my sheep, take care of them, right? But then the conversation continues in verse 18. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus says. When you were younger, he's telling Peter, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to Peter again, come on, bro, I told you this in the beginning. I'm reinstating you. Let's do this. Follow me. Eusebius, uh, a father of church history, he quoted a second and third century scholar by the name of Origen. Sick name. And this is, this is what Origen said. Peter was crucified. So you remember, Jesus just said, you will stretch out your hands and someone will address you and lead you where you don't want to go. Stretch out your hands, crucifixion. Jesus prophesied that would happen. And Origen says here, he writes down in history, that Peter was crucified at Rome with his head downwards as he himself had desired to suffer. Peter's death came at the hand of Emperor Nero in 67 AD. This is in the midst of the fires of Rome, the Jewish-Roman War, Nero's circus. I talk about all of that stuff. It's very interesting stuff in history of what the apostles were going through, what the, the early church was going through, the persecution taking place in the message unto death. I talk a ton about that. But here, Peter at the persecution and hand of Emperor Nero is killed. John, his death came at the, with the persecution at the hand of Emperor Domitian. Domitian killed him finally, well, I'll talk about how he gets there in a second, but in 98 AD, John dies. Let's talk about how he eventually got there. Do you know how it started, actually, though? Emperor Domitian was... Uh, a narcissist. He was a self-proclaimed Lord and God, is what he called himself. So John wouldn't worship him. So because John wouldn't worship him, Emperor Domitian threw him in a boiling vat of oil. But that couldn't kill him. Brought him in the Colosseum, couldn't kill him. Actually, all the onlookers gave their life to Jesus because when he came out and he's on harm and he starts testifying, they're like, whoa, what is this miracle here? And he's like, it's Jesus. That's what, that's what church history records. But because Emperor Domitian couldn't kill him, he exiled him to the island of Patmos in 95 AD. So he exiles him there. He's all alone. And yes, it, it sucks. Yeah, it's isolation alone. It's awful. But he wrote the last book of the Bible while he's there, the book of Revelation. He writes in Revelation, 
that he's on the island of Patmos. That's how we can connect it all when we read the scriptures here and put the history of all of these church fathers and apostles and everybody together. But after he, is, he was exiled, he's then released and he comes back to Ephesus. This is where his life ends here in Ephesus. And it's recorded in church history that as he was a leader of the church, he continued to lead the church, help the church there in Ephesus. And what I just think is so interesting, he continued to take care of Mary, Jesus' mother. Why does he do this? Because Jesus said, while he's on the cross hanging there, remember, none of the apostles are there except Mary, Mary Magdalene is mentioned, and John is the only apostle mentioned. So from the cross in John 19, verse 26, Jesus looked down, and when he saw, when Jesus saw his mother there, and who? The disciple whom he loved. So this is the book of John, right? That's what we're talking about. John the apostle wrote it. So he didn't put his name here. He always referred to himself as the one that Jesus loved. So he sees his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby his mom. And he turns to his mom. He said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. So how does John use the rest of his days until eventually I know probably Mary died before he did. He took care of Jesus' mom, just as Jesus had said in John 19. That's what church history records. John finally dies of old age, just as Jesus had illustrated. Remember in John 21, he's having this conversation with Peter. He reinstates Peter, and then he's like, Peter, your hands are going to get stretched out. You're going to die in a way you don't like, all this stuff in the first half. In the second half, though, verse 20, it says, Peter turned and saw that this disciple whom Jesus loved, there it is again, was following them. This was the one whom had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, so Peter sees John following Jesus. So Peter's kind of, his entrance is perked. He's just now told how he's going to die. And he's like, what? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? What about John? How's John going to die? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Focus on your own stuff, Peter, he's saying. You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple, John, would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. He's at me, John. Yeah, Jesus wrote about me. What is Jesus saying here? I was going to die different than the rest. I was going to live longer than the rest. It wasn't going to be like what was going to happen with Peter. And Jesus is telling Peter, listen, Peter, you worry about yourself. You be faithful to me. John has to be faithful as well, just in a different way. I detailed out 14 martyrs of the faith. In the message, nothing's going to stop us. I did the 12 apostles. The 12th one is Matthias, because remember Judas Iscariot, he committed suicide. So Matthias in Acts 1, they cast lots. He replaced him. But I also uh, attached in that message uh, with the details of how the apostle Paul died and uh, James, the brother of Jesus, the one who led the church of Jer Jerusalem. What I need you to understand, though, is that, that there's so many more. I didn't even include in that list Barnabas. Remember Barnabas, the tag team partner of the Apostle Paul? Acts 11 to 15, we see them on that first missionary journey doing ministry together. He was stoned to death in the ancient Greek city of Thessalonica in 61 AD. John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, who wrote the book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He was martyred in Egypt in 68 AD. You know how they killed him? They put a rope around his neck, attached it to horses, and they drug him through the city until he finally died from it. This isn't even including Luke. Luke, the doctor, the evangelist, the one who traveled with the Apostle Paul and wrote down all the accounts that we refer to now as what? The Acts of the Apostles. Luke died in 84 AD when he was hanged in Greece 
because he was so persistent in preaching to the lost Gentiles. The list, I'm just talking, these were just people mentioned in the Bible. All throughout church history, and now we even see it all over the world, people being martyred for a faith in Jesus. But these men, women in the faith, because they were consistent, because they didn't stop preaching, because they were willing to die for Jesus. They were willing to say, nothing's going to stop us. Even death can't stop us because the blood is the seed that will rise up the church. Every single one of them were willing to give their lives. Honestly, in the end, for Jesus, but for the back half of his name, us to some degree, because they wanted to make sure that the gospel would be preserved and that we would be able to be here today and talk about it, that we would be able to lean into this together. The price that they paid so that we could preach the gospel was not cheap. So I can't preach a cheap gospel. I'm not going to say that it's roses and, and unicorns and fairies. And I'm not going to say it's just if you name something and claim something, you'll be blessed and prospered and have lots of money and you'll get it. And I'm definitely not going to tell you that it's easy. This is not a cheap gospel. I'm not going to make it a cheap message. This is a gospel that was paid for in blood. Started with Jesus on the cross and it never stopped after that. It kept being paid for and paid for and paid for so that we would continue to pay it forward and pay it forward and pay it forward just as they did. I'm not saying that you might be martyred for the faith. Maybe we don't, we don't know the outcome of how our life is going to end following Jesus. But what I'm asking of you is that you don't make the message cheap because the price to get it here to us was not cheap. I'm asking that you actually read the scriptures and prioritize the message, the hard stuff. There's hard stuff in here to swallow. It approaches really hard conditions of our heart. It talks about people pleasing and jealousy. It talks about ga gossiping and backbiting. It talks about committing adultery and homosexuality. It talks about alcoholism. It talks about pride, the hidden stuff that no one can see. This is not a cheap gospel. So we have to live it like it was paid for at a high price. We have to live it in a way on social media that's not cheap. We have to live it in a way that we dress that's not cheap to honor the Lord. We have to live it in the way we talk and the places we go and the things we do and the people we We have to live it like it's a message that comes with weight. It's not cheap gospel. Don't minimize it. Don't take stuff out. Don't hit the stuff that's easy. Front to back, every part of it. This ain't cheap. So I'm begging you, I'm commissioning you, I am, I am requesting that you would live in a way, speak in a way, not just because the book of Acts, this book has got me, this book's got my heart, but that you would get this inside of you in such a way that people would see Jesus, not you. That wouldn't be about people seeing you. It'd be about people seeing Jesus in you. So Lord, I pray for every single person listening right now. I ask this, that this message would not fall on deaf ears. I know that it will not go forth and return void. Your word says that. But I ask that as it comes now from my lips, 
I'm just a vessel, a servant. I'm nothing but this word, your word that's coming forth. It is your voice. I'm just a mouthpiece. It's your voice. I pray that it would stir us, convict us, rejuvenate a fire and an energy inside of us like the, like the apostles had at the origin of the church. I pray that it would ignite a dangerous spirit pray that this extension would be gasoline on the fire called the Spirit. I pray that people begin to fan and to flame the gift of God. Use us for your glory, Jesus. Use us to walk out this message and not make it a cheap gospel. Let it be about you and not about us. Let it be about you and not about just churches or brands or whatever. Jesus, we want you at the forefront. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo. Love y'all. Mad love.